Hi, these are edited versions of the lectures that I taught synchronously over Zoom. I hope you find them useful. Okay, so then we are ready to get into our lecture, lucky number 13 on the lasso. Okay, and so this is the last lecture uh, that fits into this um, part of the course where we are devoting time to just cover topics. Okay, and it is, um, we're going to go back to the linear model today, and in a way it will help us as a transition uh, to go back to the linear model, which we're going to do in the third part of this class, in a way. And so, in particular, we're going to go back to the linear regression model in a situation that we're going to call sparsity. We're going to define what spice, uh, sparsity is in a minute, and we're going to define an estimator that is called lasso. We're going to try to understand the properties of the lasso, and uh, we're going to see the lasso, um, in a way, has um, some issues, okay, that, um, you know, if you have been exposed to the lasso before, you probably are aware of these issues. But if you only play by ear, um, you may not be aware of this. And so we're going to, quote unquote, try to offer a solution to those issues in the form of the so-called adaptive lasso. Not the only solution, but um, it's just a popular one. And um, then um, I'm going to present some extensions and so on. Um, by the way, um, next year, I was just talking to Joel yesterday, and next next year in 481-1, Joel Horowitz is going to teach a new course that is going to be an entire quarter on the lasso. <laughs> so... We're gonna do one class today, and Joel is gonna do an entire quarter. Okay, it's not on the lasso per se; it's just gonna be on penalized estimation, high-dimensional models. But I think is is gonna be um, an interesting class. Hopefully, you get a sense of what the topic is about today. So, we're gonna start thinking about high dimensionality. So, we're gonna go back to the notation we use for the linear model. We're gonna have um, y x u be random vector, y and u scalars of before, and x is just going to be take take values in rk. We're not going to have constants here, as you're going to see in a minute. Um, so beta is going to be um, k-dimensional, and the model is the linear model. y equals x beta plus u. I'm not going to tell you exactly where the assumptions on u. That will be in a minute. Um, but we're going to have a random sample of size n from this region of y and x. And without loss of generality, today we're going to assume that the sample average of the yn is zero. So we're centering, and that's part of the reason why there's no intercept. And that the variance, this is a sample variance, of all the x's are one. Okay, so they're being like center and rescale if you want. Um, so, um, of course... These issues over here are just going to be for simplicity. This will affect the scale of some of the tuning parameters that we're going to discuss in a minute. And you could do things at a, at a, a higher level of generality with all the signals floating around. The notation gets complicated. Plus, in this literature, if you just go and read papers or some books, you'll see that this type of assumptions are typically in, um, introduced just to simplify the exposition. I just... I uh, want you to be aware that um, this is going to really simplify some of the expressions, okay? So uh, keep that in mind. I'll try to remind you when this kicks in at some point. The first one is not so important, but this one is, okay? In particular, if you're applying lasso and you're coding it yourself. Um, if, you're using a can, if you're using a can package, then it doesn't really matter uh, because probably this is, the, the package is going to do it automatically for you. The goal is going to be to estimate beta today. We're not going to talk about inference uh, in the form of hypothesis testing of confidence intervals, which uh, do have, um, there are definitely issues with lasso and that type of inference. We're just going to um, talk about estimation today. And the complication is going to be that we want to consider this case where there's so-called high dimensionality, which could mean that you have, um, you know, fewer regressors than sample size, but not by much, meaning like it's a large number of regressors, or it could mean that, for example, you have more regressors than sample size. Um, 
And for simplicity, as I said before, we're going to assume today that X and U are independent. This literature is still evolving. There are a lot of new results. Uh, if you go back to the original contributions, you're going to see that this assumption is indeed imposed that X's and U's are independent. The U's actually are typically assumed to be normal or something like that. But then after that, you know, there have been results that have weakened some of these conditions and they have implications. For example, as you can see here, this doesn't allow for heteroscasticity because there's independence, but then other papers later on allowed for the variance of U condition on X to depend on X. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. Um, so this, you know, case, sometimes people say, well, in econ, this doesn't happen often. You know, that depends on how you look at the model. That depends if you view these X's as actual regressors. We're going to call it covariates or regressors or if you view them as technical regressors, okay? Um, and, and that means, you know, for example, imagine a situation where you have, I don't know, 20 variables, but you really want to consider including squares of these variables and interactions and, and fixed effects. And now suddenly you may have a large number of covariates, even if like the, the true original covariates are uh, say 20, the minute that you start interacting them and considering like powers and so on, um, uh, then the number could be very large. And those are called technical regressors, meaning there are just manipulations of regressors that you already have, okay? Um, in other sciences that are not econ, uh, these numbers could be uh, massively big. Um, I remember um, several years ago now, I was at a conference actually with Joel, and there was this very well-known statistician presenting a paper that was an application of a penalized method like the lasso, and they were trying to see uh, what were the genes that will make a flower blossom, okay? And so, well, if you just think about how many genes you have in a flower, uh, I don't remember the number, but I can tell that was like really big and it was a lot larger than the sample size. And, you know, scientists had their conjectures about what were the main genes that will identify or will um, actually make the flower blossom. But, they <coughs> sorry, they um, wanted to do it um, uh, using one of these penalized techniques, okay? And so um, depending on the area you are in some areas or fields, this is going to be more relevant than in others. Uh, but today we're not going to question this. We're going to be assuming that we are in a situation with, where K is large. So once K is large, um, there are problems. In particular, if we're in this situation, you know, think about the case of the genes and the flowers. There are a lot more genes than sample size. OLS is not even well defined, okay? Because you have more covariates than observations. The X prime X matrix I wrote here uh, doesn't have full rank. And the estimator, you know, it's just not unique. You can uh, imagine, you know, take it to the extreme case, you have two points and three covariates, and then you can do whatever you want. So once you notice that, then you realize immediately that if, as I wrote here, all explanatory variables or covariates are important in determining the outcome Y, then it is not possible to identify these effects. Okay, so we need to do something. And the approach that it was taken in this literature is to assume that the model is so-called sparse. Okay, so, and this is going to be our starting point and the starting point of a lot of these methods. Okay, the definition is as follows. Sparsity, we're going to let S be the set of indices, okay? J indexes and uh, indice, index our covariates um, uh, is the set of indices such that beta J is different than zero, okay? This is going to be the identity of the so-called relevant regressors, okay? And a model is said to be sparse if the cardinality of this, the number of betas that are different than zero, is fixed as n goes to infinity, which in other words means that, you know, we're saying s is much smaller than n, at least eventually, right? So, whereas k may be bigger than n, okay, s is much smaller than n. And so, a way to think about this is that you have, you know, go back to the um, genes affecting uh, whether a flower blossoms or not. Well, there are gazillion genes, but there are all, only a handful of those that really matter for the question that you care about. Okay? And then, again, 
in econ, it means that you have all this model that includes all these variables and interactions and squares and, you know, not all these interactions matter, not all these, you know, um, technical regressors matter. Maybe some of these original regressors don't even matter. So that's the assumption. And all this works under this assumption. So assuming that the model is sparse is going to be uh, an important starting point. Then we're going to define a benchmark to what we can do that we're going to call the Oracle. And the Oracle is the least squares estimator that you would do if you just know the identity of these relevant regressors. Okay. So you just know the truth. You know, you say, look, look, you have a gazillion covariates, but there are only these 10 that really matter. And I'm going to run a regression of my outcome on this, just these 10 regressors. That's what we're going to call the Oracle. And it's going to be, oops. Um, beta hat O N. Okay. And it's invisible. Uh, we're, we're not going to be able to do this, but it's going to be a, when, our benchmark. When we come up with an estimator that is feasible, we will, we will want at the end of the day to compare the performance of our estimator with this Oracle estimator. Okay. So it's important to know that sparsity is an assumption that tells us that the model is sparse. But it is not an assumption that says that we know uh, the identity of the relevant regressors. We are just assuming that there are a few. Then this sparsity, this is the Oracle estimator. We're going to define our three properties of an estimator we may derive. Okay. And I wrote here, in practice, we do not know the set S. Okay. So our goal is to estimate beta. And perhaps, you know, estimate the set S, meaning we want to say something about beta. We want to say something about what are the regressors that are important. Okay. And we're going to do this by exploiting this assumption of sparsity. And there are three properties that we're going to discuss. One is called estimation consistency. This is exactly what we call consistency before. Nothing different. It just says that an estimator is estimation consistent if beta hat conversion in probability to beta. You can just call this consistency. The reason why typically in this literature will clarify that you mean estimation consistency is because there's something else, which is our se second definition that is called model selection consistency. And model selection consistency says the following. If you define S hat as a set of covariates that have uh, estimated beta hat different than zero, okay? then you want the probability that S hat equals to S goes to one as N goes to infinity. And if that happens, then you have model selection consistency. You are identifying the identity of this relevant regressors with probability approaching one. And so this estimator here, beta hat, is called model selection consistent. So model selection consistent and estimation consistency or the usual consistency that we use are two different properties. And then finally, there's one called Oracle efficiency and says an estimator beta hat is Oracle efficient if it achieves the same asymptotic variance as the Oracle estimator. Okay. So this is going to be our benchmark. As I said, uh, we want to check if we can do as well as the Oracle. Okay. And if we do, we're going to be happy. If we don't, there's maybe room to improve. So I'm going to be talking about these three properties as we move along. Um, but again, these are generic properties of an estimator and some estimators may satisfy this and not this or, or the last one, not the first one and so on. Not in that order, but, um, you get the point. So what is lasso? Lasso is short for least, ab least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. And probably, I'm pretty sure that all of you at least heard about the lasso. It is definitely one of the well-known estimators for sparse models. And what the lasso does is to estimate beta, but solving the following optimization problem, beta hat, the lasso estimator, minimizes the sum of square residuals. This is the same thing that least squares does, plus a penalty term. And the penalty term has a uh, parameter lambda, which is going to be a tuning parameter, which is, um, in a way, how much we want to penalize. And then it has a, a penalty function, which is an L1 penalty function. It sums the absolute value of the coefficients. Okay. And so the idea 
is that you know you want to minimize the sum of squares but you don't want you know this um norm to be too big okay if that becomes too big it just uh, doesn't help minimizing this function and of course you know how much you want to penalize is going to depend on how big this uh parameter lambda is we're going to talk later about how to choose lambda not now for now just say that lambda is a scalar parameter there's a tuning that you will have to determine in the same way that we chose you know bandwidth when we did non-parameter regression or something like that so a feature that we're going to use sometimes to do pictures is that this problem can be alternatively described as a solution to minimize the sum of squares subject to this restriction where like now you want the norm not to exceed some threshold that here I'm calling TN. And so in this representation, TN is a tuning parameter and this representation, Lambda is a tuning parameter. There's a mapping from one to the other one, but here one and two are two equivalent representations of the same problem that lead to exactly the same solution. So lasso corresponds to least squares with an additional term that imposes a penalty for non-zero coefficients. Okay, and I wrote here the penalty term shrinks the estimated coefficients towards zero, and this gives us model selection. Okay, at, bait, at the cost of introducing bias in the coefficients. We're gonna see nothing is free. By penalizing, we're gonna be able to detect the coefficients that are zero, but we're gonna be introducing some bias to those that are coefficients that are not um, zero. But this is the problem that Lasso solves. Okay, is um, often call, and we're going to see this later, a penalized estimator. And it's a penalized estimator because it penalizes the magnitude of the coefficients. Now, the feature that makes Lasso special is that the estimated coefficients, the actual beta hats that you obtain, can be exactly zero for any given sample size. Okay? So when people say Lasso gives you true zeros, this is what they mean, that you just put this in the computer and the actual number that you're going to get is an actual zero, as opposed to 0 0.0003 or anything. It's just an actual zero. And this has to do um, for the choice of penalty that Lasso uses. The form of the penalty is important for selection, which does not occur under uh, OLS or other penalty functions, for example, um, rich uh, regression. If you ever heard about rich regression, it's going to be um, exactly the problem that we um, described uh, before, but where the penalty function is exactly like this, where there's an exponent here equal to two. Okay, this is called rich regression. It's been studied a long time ago. Okay, and so, um, you know, it's another type of uh, penalty that doesn't give this feature that Lasso has. It doesn't give you true zeros. It gives you estimators that are bigger, estimators that are smaller, but it doesn't give you true zeros, okay? So actually, not only that not only happens for gamma equal to two, as I wrote here, whenever gamma is greater than one, okay? Remember, for the Lasso, gamma is one. It's just the absolute value. But whenever gamma is strictly greater than one, the objective function is continuously differentiable at all points. This is a key feature, all right? And so you can just take first order conditions from the optimization problem that we have here, right? With gamma greater than one. And the first order condition will be two times the sum of y minus x beta times x. This is the usual first order condition that we have for least squares estimator with the distance in the first lecture. And then you have the derivative of the penalty, which in the case where this gamma is greater than one, it's just lambda times gamma times the absolute value of beta to the gamma minus one times the sine of beta. And so now suppose, I wrote here, suppose that the true beta is zero. So this is a regressor that is belongs to the part of irrelevant regressors, that those that have coefficients equal to zero. Then if this is the case, you will like your estimator to also be zero. But in this case where the function is differentiable, beta hat is gonna be zero if and only if you have that this over here, okay, with beta hat equals this over here, which is just zero because you have beta hat in there, like the absolute value of zero is zero. So the entire expression here becomes zero. So it has to be that this 
equals zero. Okay. And this happens with probability zero because this is an average of a continuously distributed random variable. Let's say, so assume that Y is continuously distributed and the X's are continuously distributed. Okay. Or you can write it like this with the use by replacing Y by what it is. And then if U is continuously distributed, I wrote here, this holds with probability zero and model selection does not occur. Model selection, I mean, you don't have an estimator, okay, that is exactly equal to zero. So the conclusion from this is that gamma greater than one does not gives us true zeros. Is this point clear? So now we understand, hopefully, uh, that this is a problem, that having lambda greater than one doesn't give us um, exact zeros. But we said lasso, I said at the top, um, uh, does give us um, zeros. So why is this? Well, what happens is that when gamma here in this case, gamma is one, okay? So we just, just the absolute value. This function happens to be non-differentiable at zero, right? Think about how the absolute value looks like. It looks like this, right? And it's differentiable everywhere except at zero, okay? Where you have a cusp. And so how do you obtain first order conditions for a case like this? Well, in order to do that, you need the notion of subgrading. So I wrote here, if gamma is less than or equal to one, the penalty function is not differentiable at zero. In this case, the Kuntakian conditions are expressed in terms of the so-called subgradient. And I wrote the definition here for completeness. We say the scalar G in this case, uh, in R, is the subgradient of a function F at a point X if F of Z greater than or equal than F of X plus G times Z minus X for all Z. You need to satisfy this inequality over here if G is a subgradient at the point X. Now, if you collect the set of all subgradients at X, you denote this by, um, you know, a partial F, and this is called the subdifferential of X at X. And here, you know, we're not gonna apply this to a bunch of different functions. In our case, we're gonna apply this only to the absolute value. So let's see how this apply to the absolute value. So here I plotted the absolute value, that's a function. And then at any point that is not zero, the function is actually differentiable, right? And it has a derivative negative one here and plus one over here. So I wrote for X then less than zero, the subgradient is uniquely given by the derivative, which is negative one. And for X positive, the derivative is one. So that's the subgradient, subdifferential, and the derivative because the function is nice. At zero, we have that the function is not differentiable. So what we need to check is our inequality over here, which gives us a subgradient. And so in this context, it just becomes this because X is zero. And so we have to be any G such that the absolute value of Z is greater than or equal than G times Z. And that gives you any G in between negative one and one. So what is this sub uh, differential of the function f at zero is just any point between negative one and one. And here I just put some examples, you know, with a half, with negative half, okay? Any function that just uh, goes over here and is below uh, both this and this, that's gonna work. And you can see if you just put a pen on top that anything that moves between those two things are gonna be a valid uh, subdifferential. So in order to determine the first order conditions of the lasso, since the lasso has this absolute value business in the penalty, we need to use the subdifferential. So what I'm gonna do next is to rethink the first order conditions now for the case of the lasso, as opposed to the case of the continuously differentiable case we did in the previous slide. And then we're gonna see how this use of the subdifferential impacts okay, our properties. And in particular, I want you to remember this that the sub differential of the function at zero is any number in between negative one and one. So um, if you just
take this first order condition, write the first order conditions again. Now you have the part of the least squares function is just as always, two times the sum of y minus x prime beta hat equals to x times, and now we have the derivative of the absolute value, which is gonna be lambda times the sine of x if x is different than zero, okay? Because it's gonna be one if beta, sorry, the sine of beta if beta hat is different than zero, because, you know, if beta hat is positive, the derivative is one, so the sign is just gonna be one. If beta hat is negative, then the derivative is gonna be negative one, and this is what we obtain. But if beta hat is equal to zero, then we know that at that point, the function is non-differentiable, and then the subgradients was between negative one and one, where we're multiplying by lambda. So it gives us that this is negative lambda to lambda. And now the first order condition of lasso okay, is the one that gives a beta hat equal to zero whenever this average or this sum is in between negative lambda and lambda. And this happens with positive probability, okay? Because now we're not asking that the sum is equal to a number, we're asking that the sum falls into an interval, negative lambda, lambda, which of course the probability that this happens depends on lambda. The larger the lambda, the, you know, higher the probability that we're gonna get actual zeros as the solution, and the smaller the lambda, the lower this probability, of course, okay? And then model selection, which is this feature that we have in this case of the first order condition, which is the estimator gives you a true zero, happens because the penalty function has a cusp at zero, this point of non-differentiability. And this is why lasso gives you true zeros, okay? Because it checks for two order conditions. If if um, if this thing on top holds, then it's gonna give you a beta hat different than zero. If this doesn't hold, then it's just gonna give this over here, it's just gonna be an exact zero. Sometimes, you know, um, it helps to think about this uh, graphically. And, and here I'm plotting um, two problems. But now let me go back just for a second to this statement that I made over here where I said, look, you can write the problem of lasso as a penalized problem or as a restriction, okay, where you just minimize, <coughs> sorry, where you minimize the sum of squares subject to a restriction. So I wanna plot this problem, not this one, okay? This one has a nice, nicer intuition when you just do it graphically. And so notice then well, what I have is here are the level sets of the sum of squares that we're trying to say minimize, okay? And so then um, what happens is that um, we need to minimize this subject to a restriction that in the case of the lasso, you know, in this case where we have two dimensions, looks like a diamond because it's the sum of the absolute value of each of these things looks like a diamond, okay? And this is the picture on the left, gamma equal to one and it's lasso. On the right, uh, you know, we have the picture for gamma equals to two, which is rich. And we said in that case is continuously differentiable. So in that case, you see that here you need this, um, level sets to be tangent to the restriction, which in this case is a circle because we're in R2 or an oval, depending on how it is. So we need these two to be, you know, tangent. And so the odds that that happens at a point where beta hat or beta hat one or beta hat two is zero, like R is zero. And it just happened that the, um, you know, that these two are tangent at exactly that point. Whereas when you look at the lasso situation, you know, this is always gonna happen at a point here or here in this case, unless it just happens to be that the level sets, okay, are tangent to that particular line, which sometimes it may happen, right? But this here um, is what gives you the true zeros, because if you look, this solution is gonna involve beta hat one equal to zero and beta hat two equal to that, okay?
So this hopefully gives you um, graphical intuition as to why you know, using a penalty that is non-differentiable at zero gives you true zeros, and using a penalty that is smooth and nice and differentiable gives you a, a well-defined problem, but doesn't give you zero. And in part, in particular, we're going to say it doesn't give you model selection. Questions about what we said so far? Okay, so. Now we're going to talk about some of the properties of the lasso. And for the main property, um, we're going to need a condition. Um, and this condition is called the irrepresentable condition. Um, for now, I'm going to focus on the case where K is fixed as N goes to infinity. So we're not doing asymptotics where K grows with N, which are really part of this literature. I'm just don't want to get into that. And so I wrote here without loss of generality, we're going to sort the regressors so that the first S variables in X are the ones that are relevant. And the uh, second set of covariates that we're going to call X2 are the irrelevant ones. So when you look at the variance covariance matrix, according to this partition, it's just going to be X1, 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 X2, X2, X1, X2, X2. And then the representable condition is just going to say this, the sub norm, of the spec divide of x2, x1, x1, x1 inverse times the sign of this vector of the first betas has to be less than or equal to 1 minus eta for some eta. And so since this has to hold for all signs over here, just think about these conditions getting rid of this sign. And it essentially reads like this over here. And then when you look at this condition, notice this is a sub norm. So you're going to take this a vector. You're, you're going to take um, or actually a matrix, and I take the worst component, the maximum. But um, this looks like a least squares regression, right? It's expected value of x, x prime inverse, expected value of x, y. Here, y is x2. So the interpretation I wrote is that the regression coefficients of the irrelevant variables on the relevant variables, irrelevant variables on the relevant variables, must be all less than 1, okay? And these are... Uh, in a way, irrepresentable by the latter. And remember that we scale all the variables so that they have variance equal to 1. So these betas are, are normalized to uh, 1, okay, if you interpret them as like partial correlation coefficients. And so in a way, it says, you know, you cannot perfectly predict, you know, the irrelevant variables with the relevant variables and so on. This condition is strong. We're going to discuss it in a minute but it's going to be part of the statement that we're going to derive for the lasso, okay? Whoops. So the theorem says the following, suppose K and S are fixed and that X and U or I and E mutually independent. Uh, suppose that X has finite second moments and U has mean zero and variance second square. Suppose also that the representable condition holds and let's consider the two following rate conditions for the tuning parameter lambda. The first one is the lambda over n goes to zero. The second one is that lambda over n to the one plus c divided by two goes to infinity. I want you to pay attention to this last condition. In particular, this says that lambda divided by square root n goes to infinity, which is the case when c is equal to zero, okay? So when you take this over here and this over here, you know, Intuitively, one says lambda goes to um, in, um, um, infinity, but not too fast, but not too slow. Then lasso is model selection consistent. Okay, so we mean just that lasso gives us the true identity of the regressors that are relevant. If we just do lasso and collect all the yes beta hats that are uh, non-zero, so recall we define S n as um, the collection of all the j's such that beta hat and j is different than zero, then the probability that sn hat equals s goes to one. And lasso is model selection consistency, consistent. And then for that, it requires, you know, here, as I said, it says lambda n is not too big And here we're saying lambda n is big enough. 
So these two conditions are going to be, in a way, problematic because, you know, um, it's really delicate. Um, you divide by square root n, goes to infinity. You divide by n, goes to zero. So it has to be something in between, and it gives us a narrow area. But this is the result. This is a 2006 result, as you can see, and it gives uh, um, this property on the lasso. Now, the representable condition is a restrictive condition, as I wrote over here. And when this condition fails and you have lambda n divided by square root n going to some lambda star positive, okay, it can be shown that lasso selects too many variables. Okay, it selects a model, as I wrote here, of bounded size that contains all variables in S. That is, lasso selects too many regressors. And this is sort of like the property that people typically has in mind when they talk about lasso, because one, you know, the representable condition is something that people expect to uh, fail. And two, in any, you know, this condition, uh, lambda n divided by square root n going to zero is, um, you know, um, is an asymptotic approximation. And in finite samples, of course, that ratio is going to be positive. So it's, again, one of these questions about how good the approximations are to what happens in finite samples. So um, what I wrote here in, as intuition is that if the relevant and irrelevant variables are highly correlated, okay, then it's really difficult to distinguish them. Um, and that's, you know, has to do with this irrepresentable condition that in a way tells you that uh, they are not that correlated. So Knight and Fu in 2000 showed that the last estimator is asymptotically normal when you have that square root n divided, by, uh, sorry, lambda divided by square root n converts to a lambda that is um, um, lambda star that is greater than or equal to zero, okay? But finite. And this is contrast with this condition over here. To, for lasso to be model selection consistent, you need lambda divided by square root n to go to infinity. For lasso to be asymptotically normal, you need Lambda divided by square root n to go to, some, to go to something that is finite. Okay. So um, the, here's the issue, right? So the, in lasso, you will have this tension that either you get model consistency or you get asymptotic normality. I wrote here if, la, if lambda star is zero, lasso has the same limit distribution as the least square estimator, and so is not oracle efficient. You know, one condition to be oracle efficient is that we will have to be model selection consistent. We need to get this um, identity correctly. So I wrote here, note that lambda n divided by square root n converts to lambda star, you know, greater than or equal to zero is a conflict with this condition. In particular, I wrote it with the case of z equal to zero, which says lambda divided by square root n goes to infinity. And so lasso cannot be both. And I want to stress this because I feel that sometimes people don't even remember this cannot be both model selection consistent and asymptotically normal, hence oracle efficient, at the same time. So in a way, if you choose lambda big enough, you have model selection consistency. You're not going to have asymptotic normality. If you just reduce the value of lambda, you can have asymptotic normality, but you're not going to have model selection consistency. You're going to choose too many covariates. Okay, so... How can you fix this problem? Well, the goal, as I wrote here, would be to penalize small coefficients a lot and large coefficients very little, or not at all. And this could be done by using weights or by changing the penalty function. But the idea is that if you think about this problem, you want to detect the betas that are zero from the betas that are non-zero. But when you look at the last of penalty is uh, the sum, we wrote j1 to k of the absolute value of bj. So, of course, you're penalizing betas that are not zero. But suppose that you have a covariate that has a very large beta, okay, because it's a very important covariate. In the loss of penalty, that will, you know, be bad for you because you're going to have one covariate that is just going to be large. And having large effects affects the penalty. So that's what I wrote here. The idea would be that you want to penalize things that are small, but positive, but ideally you don't want to penalize large coefficients at all, because like the fact that something has a large effect is not bad per se. All you want to do is to detect 
the things that are zero from those that are non-zero. And so, as I said, there are two ways to do this, or at least two ways. One is by using weights, which we're gonna do next. And the other one is by changing the penalty function entirely. Forget about this penalty function, let's use something else. However, we learn our lesson. If we're gonna change the penalty function, we want a penalty function that is non-differentiable at zero, because that's what's gonna give us model selection, okay? So before I discuss different penalty functions, I'm gonna stick to this penalty function, and I'm gonna consider the idea of using weights. That is, I want to weight coefficients that are very large less than coefficients that are very small. And that leads to the so-called adaptive lasso. Adaptive lasso is lasso in two steps. In the first step, we're gonna estimate beta using what I call here ordinary lasso. Okay, and so you solve this problem. Notice how you have one tuning parameter here that I'm calling lambda one now because they're gonna be two. And then we're gonna assume that lambda one over square root n is some positive number. So this is giving us the result from Nan and Fu that you know this estimator is gonna be asymptotic to normal. But we're not gonna have model selection here because you know for model selection we need this lambda star to explode. Now in the second step, we're gonna collect all the coefficients from the first step that are non-zero. We're gonna call that S hat one. We know that lasso selects too many regressors, but we know that it contains the set of relevant regressors. So if there are 10 variables that are the matter, uh, lasso may give us 15, but we know that we have probability the 10 that matters are among those 15. So we're gonna just consider this set in the second step, and we're gonna do lasso again, but by changing the penalty or using weights. And what we're gonna do is first change, we're gonna use a different tuning parameter lambda. Here there's a lambda two. Second change, notice how we're weighting the penalty by the magnitude of the estimated beta in the first stage. So if in the first stage we estimated a parameter and we obtain a large coefficient, then we're gonna penalize that less than if in the first stage we obtain an estimate of the parameter that was different than zero, but small, okay? And so we're gonna penalize those a lot. In this second stage, we're gonna require or use a smaller value of lambda two, and we're gonna ask lambda two over square root n going to zero, all right? Well, so I wrote adaptive lasso imposes a penalty in the second step that is inversely proportional to the magnitude of the estimated coefficients in the first stage or step. And so the result is that lasso is model selection consistent and oracle efficient, okay? That is a square root n beta tilde minus beta conversion distribution to a normal with mean zero and variance sigma squared times spective value of x1, x1 prime inverse. This is the same asymptotic variance that you obtain from the Oracle estimator, which is the one that just uses x1 because the Oracle estimator knows that only x1 matters and x2 don't matter, okay? So this theorem tells you that adaptive lasso gives you the three properties that we wanted. Okay, it's model selection consistent, it's consistent, and it gives us oracle efficiency. So I wrote, oracle efficiency. Know that the asymptotic variance is the same, that uh, the, the same we would have achieved had we known to set S and perform OLS on it. The rates of lambda one and lambda two are important for this result. We're gonna see that, how it plays out in the proof. Um, to see why adaptive lasso is model selection consistent and article efficient. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know, I wrote here, but I don't, I don't think that this helps. I think what helps it better is the uh, proof that we're gonna do next. But the idea here is that the model, uh, remember that it's sparse and only the S coefficients, uh, first S coefficients are different than zero, okay? But the first step in the lasso is just gonna give us uh, coefficients that are um, more coefficients than the S, but that aren't gonna include these S's as I said before. So the idea is that the adaptive lasso is gonna exploit this inequality, which is this is the model, this is lasso, and this is all. 
you start with all. In the first step, you get R, which are more than S. And in the second step, you just uh, focus and get the other ones that are non-zero. Oh, there are, or you you set to zero those that are like really small and have a penalty. So you do this in two steps. But notice that Adaptive Blaster uses a different penalty in the second step because it weights um, the L1 penalty by the size of the estimated coefficient in the first step. Anyway, um, I want to now um, see what's the role of this uh, lambda over here and why this condition gives us model selection over here while exploiting this, which is what gives us uh, the result in night and foo. Remember I wrote before, here, night and foo gives us asymptotic normality under this condition. So in the first step, we're gonna have an estimator that is gonna be asymptotically normal, or you can say square root n beta hat minus beta is gonna be big OP1. And I want to exploit this in the next proof, which is what we obtain in the first step. It is actually asymptotically normal, but I don't care about normality. All I care about is that that's big OP1. So do you have any questions before we start with the two arguments? I want to illustrate how the proof works with looking at the first order conditions of adaptive lasso. This is an informal argument, but sometimes it helps to understand uh, what's going on. So I'm going to do the following. I'm going to rewrite um, the step of the adaptive lasso, okay? Um, and then you can manipulate the criterion function so that you replace beta with u. And u is just square root n b minus beta. So you do that and you're just gonna show up here. See, so um, um, this is a, a change in, uh, sort of like a change of variables from B to U. And then it's kind of like, um, it takes some steps to do this, so I'm not gonna do it. Believe me for a second that you can rephrase the problem like this and rewrite the estimator in this way. Okay, nice. Notice here, just in case, because it's gonna be important later, that the, the now the argument that you're minimizing is U. Now, we're going to consider two cases. The first one is the case where beta j, this is a coefficient of interest, is zero. I'm going to say by step one, okay, we're going to have that square root n beta hat n j, which is the one that you obtain from the first stage in the last of minus beta. We said this is OP1 by the results in night and foo. But then, since beta j is zero, whoops, then we have that the square root n beta hat and j is big O p one. So we're going to use that. Now look at the penalty. The penalty here is lambda to n times the absolute value of beta hat and j inverse times one over square root n uj. Why? Because in this case, if you just look here at the top, uh, this guy here is zero, this guy here is zero, right? So it simplifies. That's the penalty. And so let me write this as lambda to n absolute value of uj. I forgot an absolute value here. Let's just put it divided by beta hat and j square root n. And now this guy here in the denominator is big O p1, right? This is what we did here at the top. So this is big O p1 times lambda 2n absolute value of uj. Now suppose the solution here, suppose the solution is bj different than zero, then this means that uj is just square root n bj. Remember, here's the definition at the top of u and bj is zero. And so then, Lambda 2n 
times the absolute value of uj goes to infinity because lambda 2n goes to infinity. And this is a problem. The penalty explodes. And so bj different than zero cannot be a solution. Cannot be the solution. Solution is bj zero. So if the true beta is zero, and then you look what adaptive lasso is doing in the second step, then adaptive lasso is going to give you an estimator, an estimated value that is just going to be zero, okay, for large n. Because otherwise, the penalty is just going to be too big if you just try to, uh, if you consider any other solution for this problem, okay? So if beta j is zero, adaptive lasso gives you zeros. Now we need to think about what happens when the beta j is not zero. And when the beta j is not zero, what you want is that the penalty not to play any role. It's like you want the optimization problem to be less penalized when we're close to zero, but when we're far from zero, let's just want to behave as if we're doing least squares. So let's see what happens there. Same problem. We're back to exactly the same expression, but now I want to consider beta j equal to zero. By the way, do you finish copying? Perhaps you were looking at something here. Are we good? Can, can I move forward? Or do you need to copy something? A pause or a good? A good. Great. So consider now beta j not zero. Again, so what does this mean? This means, remember, square root n, beta hat and j minus beta j is big O P one by night and foo. This is the first step, right? And so you can say, um, um, something like beta hat and J is beta J plus big O P N to the negative half, or in other words, I'm going to use this beta hat and J is big O P one in this case. So now let's go to the penalty. We have lambda 2n, absolute value of beta hat and j inverse, okay, times beta j plus one over square root n uj minus beta j. And so this is going to be for n large equal to lambda two times one over square root n uj. Okay, where we are essentially exploiting this over here and this over here. This is not difficult to see, but you know it requires to do consider some cases of the absolute value. So believe me this step and you can check it later. Okay, so the thing. What's that? Where? Beta hat and J equals beta P one. Here, you mean? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Here? Oh, I screwed up. So hold on. OP one. Sorry. So you're saying here, Audrey? Yeah, I'm wondering if I'm like. Um, so first, the square root of minus one, and the mm, no, let's review what I did. I started with this expression over here, and I took the square root n to the other side. So I got a op n to the negative uh, one half, right? And then I put the beta j on the other side. So beta hat j is beta j plus op negative one half. And so beta nj 
you can say it's just big OP1 because it's, this is big OP1, this is big OPN to the negative one half and big OP1 dominates. So you have big OP1. I mean, you can use either. What matters is this expression over here, Audrey, because we're saying beta hat is beta j plus something small. And so here we have beta j, beta j. Here we're dividing by beta hat. And, you know, I'm saying when I'm doing this uh, wiggle here, I'm just saying, well, it's like I'm dividing by beta j. I divide by beta j, whatever, and then these things will cancel out. Okay? It's just, But what matters is that beta hat doesn't explode. It's just bounded. So then this happens. And now that we have this, notice the following. If the solution is such that uj, which is square n, bj minus beta j is big O p1, then this penalty is lambda n lambda 2n divided by square root n times big OP1. And this here goes to zero. So the penalty goes to zero. And so it follows that the penalty, or I'm going to say it follows that there is no penalty for coefficients that are non-zero. Okay, so if you put two things together, when beta j is zero, adaptive lasso is just going to give you a zero estimator when it is large, okay? Because otherwise the penalty explodes. But when beta j is non-zero, then adaptive lasso is essentially behaving as least squares. It's behaving as if all this term, all this term is not there, which is the least squares problem, okay? The penalty goes to zero. So it's not penalizing the betas that are non-zero. It's penalizing the betas that are close to zero. And that gives you model selection and oracle efficiency because you're not touching too much the ones that are big. Questions? Uh, let's keep going. Um, so, as I said, you know, adaptive lasso is a way to think about the problem by waiting. But another approach would be to change the penalty. Okay. So I wrote here, another way to achieve model selection consistent estimator is to use a penalty function that is strictly concave, okay, as a function, say, of the absolute value and has a cusp at the origin. So we need the cusp at the origin. We need the function to be non-differentiable at the origin, okay? And because that's what gives us true zeros. So if you plot now, remember the absolute value looks like this, right? And what's the conceptual problem with the absolute value is that for coefficients that are really far from zero, we're penalizing a ton, okay? You know, the, the penalty here is really high, let's say. And why would you want to penalize betas that are high? Uh, those are not a problem. You want to detect the zero. So the idea here would be to use penalties that are like the absolute value early on, but then, you know, you want something to be like this. So eventually you're not penalizing things that are very big. And that will be strictly concave. Okay, just look at one side of the origin. Um, and so when you think about the problem like this, then you realize that lasso is essentially least squares with an L1 penalty. And it belongs to this larger class of estimators that are called penalized least squares. Um, penalized least squares are the family of estimators that solve this problem. You minimize the sum of squares but you add a penalty. And notice here that P lambda is just a function. I didn't tell you what that is. It's just a function of the absolute value of the estimated coefficient. And then uh, lambda, which is the tuning parameter, is embedded in the definition of the function. So lasso corresponds to the case where P lambda is just lambda times the absolute value. But now we want to consider other penalties that are strictly concave, okay, as opposed to this one that is not strictly concave. It just keeps going as you 
uh, move away from zero. All right. So when you get into the world of penalized least squares, there are so many penalties that I don't uh, fully know. Uh, but uh, some of them that I'm going to describe next are bridge and one called smoothly clipped absolute deviations, or it's called SCAD. Okay. And there's also minimax concave. And there, believe me, there are many others. Okay. And at this point, um, as far as my knowledge goes, I don't think there's a clear winner. Okay. Meaning, you know, so far, it's just uh, one of these cases where, like every other day, somebody comes with a new penalty and tell, tries to convince you that their penalty is better because he has this property, that property, and whatever. But anyway, but these are popular. So let me show you some pictures. So here we have the bridge penalty, okay, which is the same one that we had for lasso, except that instead of being the absolute value, we consider gamma strictly less than one, okay? Because remember, strictly greater than one gives us something that doesn't have a cusp at zero, okay? And so here, the bridge penalty is a solid line. So let's um, let's use it with uh, orange. This is bridge, okay? Whoops, why? No. I don't know why this sometimes wants to. This is bridge. Then um, the other one is called a scat. And one feature of scat is that scat, two things are important. The first one, it has an additional tuning parameter, not only lambda. Lambda is here, okay, but there's also this A, and A appears here. So here we're adding yet another tuning parameter. Two, scat is presented always in terms of its derivative, okay? So when people report SCAT, they just talk about the derivative, okay? And the idea of the derivative is that the derivative is gonna be um, like the absolute value early on, and at some point, it's just gonna shift to be essentially flat, okay? And so that's why you have this and this over here, and we're gonna say, whoops, this is SCAT. And then the last one is, you can barely see it, but it's here, let's put it in green, is minimax concave, which in that case, the penalty takes this form over here. Anyway, I'm not gonna present properties or results about this, but as you're gonna, uh, you're gonna see this uh, estimators are under similar conditions, penalized estimators are gonna give you model selection consistency and oracle efficiency, which are the two things that people are looking for, right? They want to give the right model and they want to estimate um, at the right rate, um, et cetera. All right? So, and as I said, there are others. I'm assuming Joel next year is gonna cover some of those in, in detail, um, And but um, so far, this is all I wanna say. But all these methods, if you ask yourself, remember, uh, why would you change the penalty of the lasso? Because the lasso was the first insight to say, look, you can get true zeros. And people got excited. That, you know, result that we did when we talk about the subgrading, how you get true zeros, that, that was uh, an important insight. The penalty matters and having a discontinuity at zero matters, okay? But then, you know, as I said, this tension between having model consistency and local asymptotic normality is a problem. And so the search was to have both. And this change in the penalty was triggered by that. Now, regardless of the method that you use, we're gonna have to choose lambda, okay? And, you know, as I said earlier, at some point, uh, one common way of choosing tuning parameters in general, and I talk about this, I mentioned briefly this when we talk about random forest, when we talk about non-parametric regression, is the idea of using cross-validation. And so, um, lambda for say ordinary lasso is often choose, chosen by what I call here Q-fold cross-validation. And actually for say something like adaptive lasso, you do the same, except that you're gonna do it in two stages, okay? But how does cross-validation works? It works as follows. Here Q is a tuning parameter, but it's some number, which determines the number of subsets in which you're gonna divide your data. Your total sample size is going to be Q times NQ. So you're going to partition your data into Q sets. Okay. So first step, partition the sample into the sets I1, IQ, each with NQ members. Okay. Then for each of these subsets, 
We're going to perform last using all the observations, but excluding those in the set IQ. Okay, so first you remove the observations in I1, then you remove the observations in I2, and you keep doing that. You call your lasso estimator beta hat negative Q, meaning is it leave those observations out. This is related to the leave one out estimator. If you ever hear about that, this would be a, a leave Q out. You leave Q observations out when you estimate, and then you do it by defining this partition and leaving these subsets out. Then you calculate the square prediction error of this estimator by just the sum over the observations that you left out. Okay, so there's a reason why you left, you know, this call sample splitting, as I say, you use all these observations to estimate beta hat, but then you use the other observations, the one that you left out to compute the error in prediction, okay, or square prediction error. Now you're sort of like trying to predict your Y's with your model, X prime beta, and then you take that square. Now you repeat this for each of the sets, and what you have is a gamma lambda function that sums all this over the Q subsets. And then what is the cross-validated lambda? Is the value of lambda that minimizes this mean square error. And that is cross-validation. This idea can be applied to essentially any problem where you have to choose a tuning parameter. Just split your sample, just estimate it, uh, use part of the sample to estimate your parameter, the other part to compute the error, and then choose a tuning parameter that gives you a good error. And then in some literatures, you know, the properties of the cross-validated selection of tuning parameters by this approach has been well studied, and others, they have not. And in the case of the last, I'm going to tell you in a minute uh, about what's known. But do you understand how you do this? And by the way, if you just do lasso, for example, using some packages, you're going to see that they are doing this in the background. It's really fast. It looks like you have to, you know, weigh whatever. It's just really fast. Uh, but um, you know, it's a good idea to know uh, the same. In the same way that I stressed this out when we talked about random forest, is a good idea to know what are the tuning parameters behind your approach so that you know when you're using a CAN package, you know, you can ask yourself, how are you choosing Q? How are you choosing Lambda? How like, people will ask you these questions. You need to know. You need to for that you need to read the documentation, the help, and see what they're doing. Okay. So lasso with cross-validation. I wrote there exist few results about the properties of the lasso when lambda is chosen with cross-validation. This happens in a lot of settings, okay, where people just use cross-validation and let's just cross their fingers hoping that it hopes that it works to give you a sense of how far we are with the literature and where we stand. There's a 2020 paper published in the Annals of Statistics by Denis Shevarikov and Viktor Shinosukov and um, uh, Chibin Liao. Uh, I forgot, but um, that show that in a model where K is allowed to depend on N and then where you assume that the distribution of U condition X is Gaussian, then you can bound, this is a finite sample bound on the rate of convergence of the lasso estimator, and you can show that it takes this form. This rate of convergence is less than or equal than a constant, the Q, which is what you use, sorry, for cross-validation, and then in S, log K, and log to the 7 8th, Q, N, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, these logs expressions complicated appear in this type of analysis. And then uh, what you show, what you can know is that this rate of convergence is the best that you can do, okay? So this is the optimal rate of convergence. And so lasso is nearly optimal in the sense that it's that rate just multiplied by a log rate. And so right now, as of 2020, we know that Cross-validated lasso works when it comes to consistency, meaning if you just select lambda using cross-validation, lasso is consistent. Uh, yet, you know, if you just care about asymptotic normality and these things that we discussed uh, before, it's still unknown. Okay, so that's where we stand. Uh, people use cross-validation all the time, regardless, because there's nothing better to do. Okay, um, this was a it's, it's a difficult paper, and it's just about consistency. It tells you how challenging some of the, these topics are uh, from a technical point of view. So finally, 
I'm going to say there are other ways of choosing Lambda. Okay, for example, you can minimize some Bayesian information criteria. Okay, here I wrote it. Like in that case, you just um, uh, compute this, and then you compute this, and then you solve it. And again, under some conditions, choosing Lambda this way uh, will work. Okay, but um, on some, some other conditions, it will work poorly. So um, anyway. Um, and, you know, one important thing is that today we focus on the case where K was fixed as N goes to infinity, but a lot of the papers that I mentioned in the extensions, okay, are valid for cases where K is allowed to grow at an exponential rate from the sample size, or even there are papers now that can see the case where K grows exponentially with N, which is the type of results you need to consider papers like I said earlier, when you consider the genes and the, whether the flower blossoms, because you know, in that case is, I think the, the number of observations, that paper was in the order of millions, okay? So they have a lot of observations, but the number of covariants were like, as I said, it was just so big that I don't even remember the actual number. It was way, way higher than millions, okay? The genes, there were a lot. So there are many packages to do lasso estimation. There are even some in Stata. And in R, like I just mentioned two here, but R, you know, it just increases, um, People just come out with new packages um, often. And as I wrote, as I said earlier, Joel will teach an entire quarter on the lasso in 481.1 next year. I think it's gonna be a cool class. So if you just care about learning some of these uh, um, high dimensional methods, I encourage you to take that class. The class is gonna be theoretical, but there are also gonna be some hands-on problems so you learn how to do these things in practice, okay? So um, that's it for today. I'm done. And this is all we're going to learn about the lasso. Hopefully, you can call yourself lasso experts now. So let's move to questions.